right. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Construction Hall of Fame podcast. Today, we are super excited to have Matt Graves on the show. Thanks for being here today, Matt. Hey, what's going on, Matt? Another day, another beautiful day. So, Matt, do us a favor for the audience who doesn't know you, which I have a feeling might be based on, you know, how active you've been on LinkedIn, what you've been building over the last year. A good amount of people are probably going to know who you are. But for those who don't, would you mind giving us just a little background about how you got to where you are in your career up to date as an owner's rep at AGCM? Yeah. So um, I guess getting interest, interested in construction kind of started when I was really in high school. I kind of worked for my dad. We were doing underground uh underground utility construction, fiber optics and whatnot. And then one summer they, him and his business partner bought a house and we spent the whole summer basically built remodeling his house to flip it. And I got real interested in kind of construction then. And then I went to uh, Texas A&M and I majored in civil engineering. I, I don't, I, I thought I wanted to be a custom home builder. And for some reason uh, I thought civil engineering was a path for that. I, you're 18, you don't know what the hell you're doing. So I got halfway through engineering school and decided I don't want to be a proper engineer. So then I was able to uh, kind of specialize the last year, year and a half in uh, construction project management. And then uh, I graduated in 2010. The economy was just coming out of the recession. Uh, hard to find work. I, I ended up getting a job with a company that um, did physical security barriers. Um, a lot of crash rate project products, bollards, uh, active vehicle barriers, passive vehicle barriers. It was all mostly federal contracting work. Um, we worked on military bases, FBI buildings, different VA hospitals, anything that really required high security products on the perimeter. I, the industry was cool. Um, got to see a lot of crash tests, actual crash tests and stuff. And then we, um, obviously doing a lot of federal work. You got, you got, you know, kind of baptized in that sort of thing. Um, learned a ton. And then after I left there, I went to work for a mechanical and plumbing subcontractor and I was a project manager with them for about four years. And then for the last four years, I've been with uh, AGCM um, based out of Texas. Uh, it's an owner's rep firm. Um, and I've been with them for four years. Been working on a community college, now a county courthouse, big $200 million county courthouse program. So it's been it's been fun. Love it. Love it. And it sounds like you have more going on than just AGCM. It's You got some other stuff going on, right? Yeah. So um, really in 2020, I, I started a blog and then and then COVID hit and I stopped working on that, but it was construction Yeti was the idea. And it was going to have a bunch of like construction management type articles and just construction stuff. And I was trying to play the SEO game and the Google search game. And anyway, I kind of stopped after about 10 or 12 articles. I kind of stopped with that. But then this last year, 2022, around June-ish, I had an idea of, I saw a bunch of people doing these newsletters. I was like, man, the construction industry could use something like that and make it fun. Cause you see people do these newsletters and you see, you know, articles and it's always like, boring white paper type uh textbook and you know just big blocks of text and real hard you know just boring and so i, I launched the construction curiosities newsletter i think it was in june uh 2022 and the idea was try to make it short make it sweet make it entertaining uh with gifts and there's a meme every week and just try to make it fun but try to teach somebody something every week as well so i've been doing that and then posting on LinkedIn a lot more and kind of social media in general, because I created this thing. It's free, but it's now I got to go sell it to try to build up a subscriber base. So then started posting on LinkedIn and then kind of just really been enjoying that whole marketing game now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've been following your content for some time now and it's definitely unique. You're doing something that it's, it's standing out in the industry. And I believe the industry needs more of this people stepping up and, and really just, you know, representing the industry and showing people really what's out there, what's possible. And, and what you talk about was staying curious. I'd love to talk about this more because I believe curiosity has led me to where I am today in many ways. It's like, you know, you go learn from this great person and this great person. I'm always curious about like, how can I learn? How can I grow? What do you mean when you talk about construction curiosities? Like, what does that mean for you? Well, the idea, when I first started it, I had an idea, the genesis of the newsletter was be more of a community. And uh, I was wanting people to go onto the Substack and like write comments and post comments and start a conversation. And the idea was like, I'm always Googling, I'm always reading something. I'm always like, I'll be on the job site. I'll see something I haven't seen before. And I'll go back to my office and Google it. And I'll end up watching an hour worth of YouTube videos, just learning about something. I'm just super curious about stuff. And I think that's, it's kind of really helped me in my whole career. Cause even when I started with that security company, uh, security, you know, federal contractor, I, you know, I was 23, 24 years old, fresh out of school, didn't know anything. You think you know stuff and you get in the real world and you realize you don't know anything. 
And, you know, you're sitting in these meetings and they're talking all these abbreviations and different construction terms I've never heard before. And I basically have my meeting, my, my you know, notebook on the, on the uh, column, I, anything I heard that I didn't know, I'd write it down. And then I go back to my desk and I just Google stuff. I just Google all these words and just, just learning. And I've, I feel like that kind of really um, helped me excel quicker than maybe normal. Um, I realize a lot of people don't do that sort of thing. They just, they don't care, I guess. So I've always found that to be a, um, I guess a trait I've had that's helped me kind of become a project manager faster and kind of grow. Um, so anyway, the, the newsletter was construction curiosities because I, I just had an idea and I just pulled the trigger on it. So it was just going to be about whatever I was Googling that week or whatever article I read or just, you know, there's always, um, I always share an article or a YouTube video or something interesting. And the idea was to kind of build a community around it um, that's uh, people posting comments and trying to have a, a conversation. That didn't happen. You know, I even had some seeds and I'm like, all right, I'm going to go do this thing. You know, we post some comments and my buddies were like, yeah, yeah, I'll go do it. It didn't happen. You go for the first couple episodes and there's like two comments and I'm like, okay. So I've kind of morphed and now it's kind of morphed into more of, um, I've been, one thing that I didn't realize was going to happen when I started this thing is I've been meeting so many awesome people, people like, which I would have may have thought like way outside of my, uh, you know, above me, right. Or something like that. And they'll reach out to me on LinkedIn and they'll reach out to me and man, I'm following your stuff. This is awesome. And I've been having all these conversations with people. So then I've started doing some like interviews sort of like this. Um, I'm going to end up starting a podcast in about a month or so with a, with another buddy I met through all this. And so now it's just, you know, um, this last week I interviewed, uh, Anthony Gooday. He's a, uh, real estate modular construction, real estate developer out of Los Angeles. And like, I, I'm interested in modular construction. I think it's really cool. And so I reached out to him and he was all on board. So we did like a Q and a, and it's just, I'm just trying to share or document and share, um, what I'm learning <laughs> through all this. And, and the more I learn, the more I, you know, more people are interested in participating. So it's, it's been cool. Cheers. Yeah. Don't be afraid to, to give a shameless plug at the end of the podcast about your upcoming podcast you're about to build. I want people okay. to know about this. So uh, you said something earlier that that stood out to me. It was like some people just in your perspective don't seem to care. And I thought that was so important. It's like the the want to grow often is driven by wanting. You have to want it. You have to be hungry in some ways to grow. And if you're not hungry for growth, then you're not going to go Google that thing you just saw that you were maybe a little curious about. You thought it might help mm -hmm. you in your career then you, you wouldn't Google it. You would just say, oh, okay, I'll just leave that for someone to teach me if I need to learn it. But you're actually taking the initiative and you're you're forcing yourself to grow. So yeah. I think actually the care part is actually, it's huge in my perspective from what I've seen. Yeah, um, that's kind of one thing I realized was like, even early on in my career, I'm like 23 years old, I'm working with guys that are 50 years old. And I'm hearing, at that point, I'm hearing people say like, well, I've never done that before. Yeah, you know, I don't know how to do that. I've never done that before. And I'm like, shit, I didn't know how to do anything before until I, did it the first time like nobody's ever done anything until they've done it once and so um i just i don't know eagerness to try new things i guess because i get bored easy so i'm always like i mean part of this doing this newsletter and this podcast is just i've realized like i need a problem to solve and if i don't have a problem to solve i go create a problem <laughs> and so that's kind of a uh, something i've learned about myself in the last year so i think kind of building this newsletter and having to go like I say having to go, but now I built something. Now I have to go sell it and try to grow it. It's kind of a, I created a problem. So it's been fun. Yeah. And I was actually, you took the words out of my mouth. I was just about to say, it's like a problem solving mentality. A lot of the best project managers we talk to and leaders we talk to are proactive problem solvers. They go out and seek problems to actually bring solutions and actually help drive growth. And you, I think you pretty much nailed it on the head right there. Yeah, it's been, uh, I went through a leadership uh, development program last year that our, the AGC and the company I work for kind of put us through. Um, they had an outside guy come in and teach it. And probably one of the most valuable things I got out of it was we did the Myers-Briggs assessment. And I learned, I mean, it, it was once I once they explained it to me or I read it, all the stuff about my personality type, I was like, oh, yeah, no, of course, that's obviously me. But like reading it and seeing it in, in writing and like, okay, now so much stuff makes sense. And, you know, stuff makes sense the way I am the way I am because of, kind of my personality. So, you know, realizing really what my strengths and weaknesses are and kind of going from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's from what I understand, you've been with AGCM for a few years and it's a team you're happy you're, that you're with right now. And mm -hmm. so I'm curious, like what, uh, what do you love about being with AGCM? It sounds like they invest in their people. What else? Yeah, no, it's been, uh, I've been with them 
uh, about four years, just a little over four years now. Um, it's a good organization. It's a family owned organization. Um, you're not just a number. Um, they give you a lot of autonomy to do your job. They kind of give you the tools you need to do your job and then just kind of get out of your way. Um, you know, flexibility they have, um, you know, being an owner's rep, like, I, I mean, I'm in a job trailer right now on a project site, but, um, some projects you don't have to be, and they kind of give you the flexibility as long as you get your job done. They're not micromanaging you, which I love. Um, they obviously investing in us, uh, career, career growth, um, you know, supporting goals. Like when I first started the uh, newsletter, I didn't tell really tell anybody. And I just, I didn't even tell my wife, I just did it. And I was like, I'm just gonna start this thing because I'm real bad about having ideas and not executing. And I'll have a million ideas and never pull the trigger. So it's like, that's something I'm gonna change about myself. So I just, let's just do it. And uh, the president of our company actually reached out to me and he's like, hey, I wanna talk about what you're doing. And I was like, oh great, he's gonna shut me down. And, but he was super supportive. Like we had a good conversation about it and he was just interested and he ended up, um, they were sharing it within our company, like putting it on our company homepage or our internal, you know, uh, SharePoint homepage and just kind of sharing every episode. And so, I mean, it was, they're super supportive of people's goals and ambitions and, you know, kind of if whatever you want to do, they're like, they'll do whatever they can to help you achieve it. So I really appreciated that. That's awesome for you. What does it mean to be more than a number? Um, so I, I've only, I, I'm going to preface this with, I've never worked for a massive company. I've always worked for, you know, smaller companies. Like we're 70 employees here. And I think this is about average with the companies I've worked for. Um, and so, I mean, just the fact that like the president reached out to me of our company and like wanted to talk and I've had all these conversations with him and I can like walk into his office and have a conversation with him. Or if I've got a, an idea about the company or, you know, something like that, I can go, you know, voice my opinion and people are listening and they're, they're wanting the feedback. And so you're not just, you know, I'm just envisioning, you know, these 3000, 5,000 people companies and all right, you're going to work on that project and go out there and, you know, you know, you're going to follow these procedures exactly. You know, you don't really have any autonomy and keep your mouth shut. We don't really want to hear from you. I'm just envisioning that's what the bigger companies are like, but you got to reach out to the president on LinkedIn if you want to talk to the president of uh, some of these big companies. <laughs> <laughs> and good luck hearing back from him. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting point. And actually, a lot of people, when we talk to candidates who feel burnout, they're, that not being a number is something that people talk about all the time. They're like, hey, I want to be able to, to do more. I, want, I feel maybe like I'm boxed in. I want to be able to expand. I want to grow. But I don't feel like I have the resources to talk to the people in the company who have that type of pull. It's just, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. But we hear about it actually really frequently. And with that said, I mean, when we're, we're talking about advice for companies who want to retain more of their construction management talent, what would you, what advice would you give for companies out there? Um, I mean, I, I think, I mean, AGCM, they've done a good job of retaining people here. And so I'd probably maybe just follow kind of what they built. Um, the average, I don't know what the average tenure is. It's probably seven or eight years. Um, the president's been with the company for over, well over a decade, maybe 15 years. The, you know, the VPs are all you know, over a decade, it's, um, you know, just giving people the aut autonomy, give them something valuable to work on, something that, you know, that uh, satisfies their career growth, um, satisfies their goals as people. Um, listening to them whenever they have a problem and just being good people. <laughs> and I mean, the fact that I mean, we go to, you know, a Christmas party every year, they, big, they throw a big Christmas party and company's been growing in the last few years since I've been here. And, um, but even then, you know, the new people, you may, you may not know four or five new people that hired within the last year, but for the most part, everybody knows everybody. Everyone kind of is on a first name basis. So it's, um, it's, it's kind of a real small within, within a bigger region of Texas. It's still kind of a, kind of a small knit group of people. It's been kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Treat your people right. Give them room for growth, support them. Listen to them. Sounds not, simple enough. Novel ideas, huh? Novel, right? <laughs> Sounds simple enough, but in practice, it's actually not that simple. And that's why we consistently see people jumping ship. People don't quit their job. They quit their boss. That's right. a, a big majority of the time. So at the end of the day, I mean, it sounds like AGCM is treating you well and, and you're treating them well. You're doing well because they don't need to micromanage you. You take care of projects. You show up. You're responsible. You Google things. You figure it out. So it sounds like it's a win-win over there. And, and that's what they're creating. Yeah, it's a lot of trust too, right? I mean, they don't have to micromanage me because they trust I'm 
doing my job and you know so they trust me and i trust them so Mm -hmm. and then this is a pretty interesting topic for me that i'd like your two cents on it's a lot of companies we speak to because we're recruiters right we 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 find very specific people with very specific Mm -hmm. skills that's what we do as like a headhunter or a recruiter and so companies will come to us let's just say they work on healthcare projects right like that's their bread and butter is healthcare construction they typically aren't going to be looking for someone from let's just say uh the industrial space or you know different types of construction niches right they want someone Mm -hmm. with the relevant experience But obviously that limits talent pool that can really limit the size of a talent pool you can pull from. And it can also really miss a part of the market with great people. Like there's great people out there who haven't worked on that exact project, but who could have the potential to really excel in that environment. But I see a problem is a lot of companies aren't set up with the mentorship, the training, the systems and processes to really bring people in who don't have that exact experience to get them ramped, get them up to speed, make sure they're productive and you know effective as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. What do you think are some some processes or some systems or some best practices that companies can implement to help expand their their addressable talent pool of great people? Man, that's a good question. Um, Cause I agree, like I don't have a niche really of what project types I've worked on. I've worked on literally everything from putting in vehicle barriers in the ground to <clears throat> doing HVAC and, you know, um, 30 story high rise in Austin to now I'm working on a county courthouse renovation project. Like it's, it's just all over the place. I think, I mean, to bring good people in, I think, you know, you find people that give a damn and actually, you know, we kind of talked about you know, people with care. I think if people care, you find the people that give a damn and care, it doesn't matter what the project history is. Um, you know, project management is project management, construction management, construction management, whether you're building a, a courthouse or building a hospital or whatever. Each one I know, you know, obviously has its, you know, uh, kind of quirks about it, right? But I do think people coming in, maybe that's worked in industrial that comes to healthcare, um, they may come with a different set of eyes of how this is how we did it on here. And we can apply some of these same ways on different projects. Um, I know that wasn't really your question, but I think there is a huge, if you're just out ruling out all those people, you're missing a huge talent pool. Um, but then, you know, bringing them into a company, I think you do got to be intentional with bringing them in and making sure they're a cultural fit, making sure and if they're a cultural fit, then obviously they'll be willing to learn be curious and, you know, understand your business model. And then, um, one thing that I know AGCM started doing, um, within the last year, and I think it's worked out really well is they bring people in, you know, and they don't just bring them in and day one, throw them on a project site. You know, they may have a project for them, but they're trying to bring them in a little bit earlier. Like maybe the project doesn't kick off for a month, but give them, you know, two weeks, give them three weeks, give them four weeks or whatever it is, how much ever have much time they have and let them shadow people. You know, um, let them go spend, you know, I had a guy come out and spend a day with me and we just walk around the project and I was telling, and kind of explain what we're doing here and what we've got and the problems we're having and those sort of things. Um, and then he went and spent a day or two days with somebody else and they just kind of bounced around and kind of get in the feel. One, it's helping them meet everybody. And um, two, it's, you know, they're kind of understanding what we're doing. Um, we've also started, uh, we call it AGCMU. It's a monthly um, course, essentially, where, uh, it's all done internally, but we really have, you know, three offices mostly in, in Texas, three main offices and we branch out from there, but they'll go around uh, to each office and hold the class. And um, last year it was, you know, one was like plan reading and I was like, okay, I've been reading plans for a long time. Like, this is going to be boring. I'm not gonna learn anything out of this. And the guy who did it, he was awesome. He's like, you know, you're, 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 trying to talk to a diverse group of people, you know, some people are fresh out of school and they don't really have any experience. Some guys are 65 years old and they're architects and obviously they've got this wealth of knowledge, but trying to do it in a way where it's more of a conversation. It's not just them sitting at the front of the conference room and lecturing to you. You're kind of, you know, having a conversation and then somebody with the, you know, the 65 year old architect guy can chime in with his experiences and somebody else. And, you know, I went into like, say the plane reading session with like, okay, it's gonna be a waste of my time. I had a full, whole, full, uh, full notebook paper of notes of stuff because all these little side conversations we had and like little, you know, pro tips here and there. And we was talking about, all right, what do you do? You know, plans, or I'm saying permit plans and, you know, just kind of all these little side conversations. So, um, I think having more of a, um, when you bring people in, maybe from outside your industry or stuff like that, instead of just having one person train them, I, I, I kind of like the community-based training, I guess you might call it, 
where, um, you know, everyone kind of give their own experiences and have conversation. Mm -hmm. And for me, it sounds like you have your way that you enjoy learning. And just like everybody, they have their particular mm -hmm. way that they enjoy learning. So something I think is so interesting is looking at people like the build wits of the world. I don't know if you're familiar with Aaron Witt over at build with, yeah. but they're essentially, they were doing some badass things in terms of training and helping people get up to speed and train their people with video training. And it's, there are so many different mediums that you could train someone in. Some people like text, reading books, some people like watching videos, but the truth is, like you said earlier, you can only learn so much from a book. You can only right. learn so much from a video training. So the question is for me, how can our, construction com companies in the industry who are leaders continue to build out a more robust training program so that you can ramp people who come from industry faster, more successfully to get them up to speed by in the beginning, knowing that you can have book knowledge, you can have video training, but that needs to be blended within the trenches mentorship. And also it needs to be blended with the right person who has that curious mentality of wanting to actually come in and learn. Mm -hmm. If you want, if you want to come from a different niche and come into a different type of construction, but you're not willing to learn and you don't want to learn fast, that's an issue that companies just can't solve. If you don't want it, then the company can't do anything, right? So it's such a blend of like, people need to come together and make it a team effort if it really wants to be a win. But there are so many resources that I believe are underutilized. Like when you look at the build wits of the world, mm -hmm. you look at the comments on Aaron Witt's posts, people are like, <laughs> oh my God, I've never seen this before. Like, how did you, how did you create this video about using this truck? Like, I need this for my team. It's like, come on, we like, we need to start, you know, like bringing this forward and like bringing this type of training as like a more commonplace thing for people. And it will only help companies be more effective, more productive, have a bigger talent pool they can draw from, be able to yeah. grow people faster within the company into leaders. So I think there's so much room for growth here. I don't know what you think about that, but that's my take. I agree. Um, I think a lot of companies end up with a one size fits all model, you know, like here, go watch these, you know, these videos and a lot of like, well, we've got them. We've got an access to a to an online training platform, and some of them really good, and some of them are really boring. And it's a realization I had kind of through 2020. Whenever you know, you saw all these colleges go virtual, right? And everyone was doing online classes. And I was like, man, if I, if that was me in college, I'd have failed out so fast. Because like, you know, go watch your basically go watch your college course on a on a video, right? And just like, I would have never got that done. I, I know that that's not my not my preferred learning style. I mean, I can go watch YouTube videos for a whole day of stuff I'm interested in, but if it's, you know, more of a lecture style. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think people do try to do a one size fits all model. Um, but you know, using your resources, using the technology, using your, every company is full of resources. They're full of experience, just tapping into that and, um, doing mentorship, whether it's formal or informal or just Hey, go shadow people, go shadow this guy for a day or, you know, go spend a week with the estimating group just to understand what they do. Um, there's, there's so many possibilities. Yeah, there really are. And when you look at the labor force and the numbers we're looking at, there's a huge reduction of labor force coming up over the coming years. And it's not predicted to slow down. It's only predicted to get worse, if you will. So it's the question is, how do we leverage all these seasoned veterans in the industry? And how do we allow them to be able to come in and leverage everything they've built, all the knowledge they've built, everything they know from their career? And how do we actually distill that knowledge and actually pass that on to future generations? It's huge. And if we aren't able to do that, then it will just be a bigger talent gap, a bigger problem with the talent in the industry, not knowing how to do the job or not having enough people in the industry. Whereas if we're able to continue leveling up, it could be definitely a solution, I believe, to the problem. A solution. We're going to need multiple, but it's, it could be one. I think that would definitely be a helpful thing. Um, that's kind of a prediction I've had. I mean, I'm not saying I'm alone in having this prediction, but I think in the next, you know, you start hearing more about the creator economy and all these sort of things. And as the workforce gets older and some of those older guys realize that, man, I, my knees can't do this anymore. They may take a step back and go really try to figure out the technology to go build courses or do things, kind of share the wisdom, share their knowledge. And um, hopefully that helps the kind of the next generation. Absolutely. I know we talked about it a bit earlier, you know, with like Googling and whatnot, but what would you say are some other ways a construction leader or a construction professional can practice staying curious to help them grow? Um, man, I, you talked about it earlier about being more active on LinkedIn. Um, I've really enjoyed LinkedIn. Just the people and the conversations I've, I've kind of fallen into kind of this construction circle sort of that's on there. And um, just I've been having some really good conversations with people, which have led to you know commenting on posts together and then it's like hey i want to learn more about what you're doing can we have a chat 
and then having better conversations. And I'm learning. I mean, I learned so much about modular construction, for instance. I was talking about that a minute ago with, you know, reaching out to Anthony and just say, hey, let's, you got to learn more about what you're doing. And he was an open book. And I found that so many people are so willing to help and willing to just share and talk. And um, I think that's definitely one way. Um, obviously, you Google it, you're going to get 10 blogs. And those are probably the ones you're going to read are the ones that are most, you know, search engine optimized to make it on the front page of Google. And they may not be the best and they may whatever, but um, just, you know, trying to find a community, whether it be on, you know, a LinkedIn or something like that, where you can have these conversations that maybe just kind of push your uh, boundaries of your knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, you know, people have varying opinions about putting themselves out there on social. Some people are like, oh, I don't want to do it. It's not for me. Maybe they hadn't even really considered too much of what it could do for them, or maybe they have. And then some people are like, I want to put myself out there. I, I'm, I'm okay with that. But mm -hmm. for you, what have you found some of the benefits are of, of putting yourself out there? You already mentioned meeting some cool people. W what else? So I, uh, I kind of fell into that other camp initially. That's why when I started my blog in 2020, it was Construction Yeti, and I didn't have my name anywhere on there because... I don't know, self-conscious a little bit and um, maybe a little imposter syndrome and didn't, you know, who am I and why do people care what I have to say? And then I finally just kind of said, screw it and kind of went in. And when I did the first newsletter post on LinkedIn of like, hey, I'm going to start this newsletter. I, I don't know if I've ever been as scared in my life as I was when I hit send on the on the LinkedIn post. Like, it's crazy. So I definitely get the uh, the fear that people have. And you know, I've done a few podcasts like this before and I've kind of done some of my own stuff and I used to hate to see myself on camera and hate to see or hear my voice and all those sort of things. And I've just stopped caring <laughs> once you, you kind of become numb to it. Um, and I think part of it too, is you start seeing the, uh, the benefits outweigh the negatives and like there really are no negatives, but you start seeing the benefits and I guess you were asking the benefits, uh, and it's it, my network's increased. Like I've uh, people I can call on with questions. Um, I've just learned so much. Um, you know, just this newsletter and building something, which maybe one day it'll, it'll go to fifty thousand subscribers, and I can start making some money off of it with advertisements or something. Or, you know, it's just I don't see any downside. Um, it's all upside, and people say that all the time. But you know, I don't really know where it's taking me and what it's doing. But I would I kind of started started all with not really knowing where it's going to go, but just kind of only saw, only saw positives and not negatives. Right. Yeah. It's almost like the fear of the unknown that some people just aren't even sure. They're just like, ah, oh, LinkedIn posting. Will my employer be pissed if they see me posting on LinkedIn? Actually, I just saw someone post on LinkedIn yesterday that they had a prolific brand. Like they had, had built a really solid brand for themselves. And all of a sudden one day they got a message from their employer, a leader in their company that said they have a new social media policy. They're not allowed to post on social media for X, Y, Z type of posts, et cetera. Right? right. And to some extent, I mean, maybe some organizations want to filter the type of content that that's out there because they have a brand message and they, they don't want certain types of content out there. So I'm not here to tell everyone how to run their business, but I yeah. do know that it can be very effective to get a brand message out there. I I would never, to be honest, at this point, have been having this deep of a conversation about AGCM if I had not met you and I had not met your content, right? It wouldn't right. probably have happened. So you're doing a lot for your company and they might they might actually realize it. Maybe that's why the president said, hey, I get what you're doing and I think what you're doing is really cool. Not only are you helping the industry, but you can also help get our brand name out there and your own brand name out there. So... Personally, I think that a lot can come from it. And especially, I mean, hypothetically, if I'm just thinking about yourself, your network is your net worth, a lot of the times they say. Mm -hmm. So the more people you know, the more people that could lead to an opportunity or could lead to a collab or could lead to someone who helps introduce the, your blog to someone and then the blog blows up because it gets in the hands of the right people, right? right. There, you, you never know what's going to happen in life. But I found that when you lead with goodwill and you lead with good intent and you really want to help people and you really just want to build relationships that, that are based on trust and actually doing the right thing, it comes back to you a lot of the time when you don't expect it to. It's like yeah. random how the world works, but it's beautiful. <laughs> I mean, they all, it's, it's a cliche, right? And everybody always says it, but it's like, you know, just if the more you give your network, the more you're going to get back. And like, I've definitely seen it play out that way. Um, I've had people, you know, reach out with kind of, I'm not even, I don't even look for a mentor. Like I, I like to, I don't even, I don't want a mentor. I want to learn from a bunch of people and kind of piece it together. But I've seen people like reach out to me with advice that are like, holy crap, man. Like you didn't, I don't know how you knew, but it's exactly what I needed at that moment. And, um, it's been, 
the whole thing's been cool. Yeah, I agree. Well, I'm, from a sideline perspective, I think what you're doing is really cool. So, and it actually, it's something, someone named Alex Hermosi. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Alex mm -hmm. Hermosi, but he, he put out a piece of content that was basically along the lines of give so much value away for free that people come ask you what they can buy from you. <laughs> it's like, if you're doing that, if you're just giving, 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 people will know that you're a giver and that you have good intent. And oftentimes they'll come back and say, hey, you know, Matt, you've been putting out this this blog for a year. I've gotten so much value. Can you come consult me on on my, my maybe it's it's random. Maybe it's like my mentality around my career, my mentality. You never know what people are going to come to you with. But if you just keep giving, people will come to you. It's a, I, I love that Alex Ramosi quote. Um, you follow Sahil Bloom at all? He's a, he, I don't know his whole story, but he's kind of in the, in the financial world a little bit and the startup world and whatnot. But anyway, he, he talks a lot about, uh, luck surface area. Um, and really I, I've mentioned a few people and everyone's like, what the heck are you talking about luck surface area? But essentially it's, it's almost the sort, same sort of thing. Like the more you are out there putting yourself out there and just kind of bumping into people, you know, the more you're going to get lucky. Right. Because, you know, I may talk to you and I may mention something. You can say, hey, my uncle does this. And you put me in contact with your uncle. And the next thing you know, like we're off doing something. And it's all because you're just kind of like having these conversations and talking to people and telling people what you're building and telling people what you're working on. And then funny how you just get lucky. <laughs> funny how you just get lucky. Yeah. it's. It, I heard someone say, make your own luck. If you make your own luck, you got a better shot to get lucky. Mm -hmm. So it, it pretty much it sounds like luck surface area to me. I love that luck surface area. Yeah, it's a, it was a pretty cool when I first heard it. It was like a, it was, you know, light bulb moment for me. So I've kind of, everything I've done, I've kind of realized that because you just, you kind of meet somebody, put you in contact with somebody else. You just kind of, and then you just, I don't know, you get luckier and luckier. And also I heard a quote one time that said, every link leads to a leader. So it also just reminds people, don't forget that just because you're talking to someone who you don't think can get you somewhere, treat them well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do well for people just to do well for people. Just be a good person to people. You never know who that person knows. That one person who you think knows nobody is at the bottom of the food chain, their uncle might be the, the president of the company you want to work for someday. And if you do really well by them, they might even tell their uncle, hey, I just ran into this PM the other day who he's the best mentor I've ever had. He, no one else took the time out of their day to actually mentor me, but Matt Graves did. So I think you should talk to Matt Graves. You know, you never know what's going to happen. You don't. You don't ever know who those bottom of the food chain people are going to grow up to be either. <laughs> That's also very true. Yeah, but who cares about the food chain at the end of the day? They're all people, in my opinion, too. So just being a good person is also important. But you know, but I but I also see where it's like some people think like, oh, maybe I won't give to this person because they're this type yeah. of person and I'm this person. But at the end of the day, I found the opposite mentality to be super helpful. If you don't worry about the ROI you get out of your everyday interactions, then it'll end up paying off in the in the end. A hundred percent. So. People want to know. People want to know. Young professionals want to know in this industry. How can I become the Matt Graves of my space one day? How do I get to where Matt's at? What advice would you give to people like who are wondering that? Um, I mean, if that means being a kind of construction manager, you know, type thing, or um, I mean, just keep giving a damn, um, keep learning, keep being curious, um, keep talking to people, um, create something, you know, like. Again, like this newsletter I've started and it's opened doors for me. Um, you know, they're not business venture doors necessarily, but they've opened doors for conversations with people where it's, it's helping me learn more about the industry, learn more about, you know, myself, learn more about um, just everything. And so, I mean, those are, those are kind of mine would be basically to stay curious and keep learning. Yeah. And on top of that, you have opened up business venture doors with what you're doing with this new podcast you're starting, right? I mean, it is opening up a whole a whole bunch of doors. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll give you, tell you a little bit about it. Uh, yeah, let's go. This, let's go. Uh, me and the guy I've actually met through all this stuff I've been doing in the last six months, um, Kyle Grandel, he's out of Minnesota. He He's a owner of a kind of a smaller um, owned rep type firm. Um, in about a month, uh, end of January, 1st of February, we're still trying to get it all worked out, but going to start a, um, a weekly podcast where it's going to be mostly tailored towards um, kind of entry level construction managers, construction professionals, maybe college into the entry level and entry level being zero to five years. But hopefully again, like the uh, plan reading session I was a part of where I can't learn anything out of this. Hopefully everybody can take something away from it. 
Um, but the idea is to bring on kind of industry leaders, um, maybe like even yourself, where we could bring in somebody like you and say, hey, Matt, we're, you know, if you were to give advice to entry level that are wanting to grow their career or what are employers looking for? What are call, you know, if you're a college student, what are, what do you see an employers look for in college students? And just kind of have a dialogue really kind of tailored towards the next generation of construction professionals. Um, and the idea is too, to kind of have a, have a live audience through the Riverside platform and at the end have a Q and a, um, I, I don't know the technical bits. I still got to learn some technical aspects of it, but there's a way where they can come on and have basically share the camera and basically it's almost like a call-in show sort of right where you can listen to the conversation and then any questions people can pop up and ask their question and have a dialogue with you know somebody you know the guest of the week and so that's the that's the idea and um really trying to kind of give back to the next generation of college really college kids and entry-level professionals and um you know they could be 22 years old or they could be 42 years old i found a lot of people that are coming out of different industries all right they, they've been in finance their whole life and they're they hate it and they've you know i want to go build something so I've, I've seen people you know a lot of people on linkedin i've found that are you'd call it classified as entry level and they may be 40 years old they've led a whole nother career and they're coming in and so just trying to give back and help grow the industry yeah, that's really interesting for me. And I, the more I think about this, first of all, love what you guys are about with this podcast idea. It sounds phenomenal. And for me, I'm thinking Kyle Grandel, if I understand maybe part of his intention of doing this podcast, I'm just totally assuming, but he is giving, giving, giving to the people who he might want to join his team someday mm -hmm. so that they might even come ask him about joining his team. He's building something that's valuable for the type of people who he would want to work for him. And what is more valuable than people in the construction industry. You need the best people on your team if you want to be the best or else you won't simply be the best. If you need great people, it's it's the industry. So, and that's really most industries I've ever seen, you need great people. So I can't actually name one where you don't. So, yeah. <laughs> Especially construction industry where it's, it's very people heavy. I mean, every industry is, right? But certain, you know, certain aspects of different industries are maybe more technology based or maybe more, model based or i mean if you're a day trader right that's not a people necessarily you know everyone's got their models on these sort of things but you know what's the number one variable in construction it's the labor on your estimate you know you can predict to some degree you can predict material you can predict equipment prices you can predict all these sort of things but production and your labor is the biggest variable and so i mean that's on basically the labor in the field all the way up to really all in the ranks of the management staff Kind of just going on a little bit of a rabbit hole here. Are you familiar with Chat GPT? Yeah, I've been playing around with it a lot. Whew, wow, what is this going to turn into? What an interesting <laughs> time to be alive, right? I, yeah, I did a. I've been playing with it, seeing uh, for content generation, and hell, I even had it put together a business plan for me the other day, just to see if it could do it. Um, it's kind of a little side project I'm working on with within AGCM, kind of another business venture or business line we're trying to put together. But anyway. I just typed in and said, put together a business plan and it spit out something like, oh, it's need to go edit it, but it, it definitely gave me the framework. It's, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. And this actually came to mind because we're here talking about how important people are. And in the back of my head, I'm like, well, people are still going to be extremely important when chat GPT advances in three to five. Like imagine where it's going to be in three to five years. If it can write a business plan in three seconds, imagine what it's going to be doing. I heard, I heard something yesterday. I, I forget who it was talking on YouTube, but they're basically talking about right now, chat GPT is responding to humans, like the human like voice, I believe it was. But then what happens when it starts responding to the environment and it responds not just to humans, but things around us? Like it's going to get so much smarter so fast. But still, this it, it's a it's a byproduct of people. People made this. This is literally a ref, like a technology in general is only a reflection of the people who made it at the end of the day. So it's just so amazing to see this develop and. There's no, I, I, I can't see a time in the foreseeable future, although I'm not Nostradamus by any means, but I can't see a time where people are irrelevant. It's like people will still need to be working the chat GPT if at that time point in time comes, but maybe it'll take less people to do it, but you're still getting people to actually operate it. And there's still going to be tons of other positions where you can't use chat GPT to get the job done. There's more to it. 
Yeah, and there's, you know, everyone's always afraid of the technology and the automation, you know, taking away jobs. And of course, it's going to take away some jobs, right? There's not as many factory workers as there was 100 years ago, right? The robots are building cars nowadays. Um, people talking about the truck drivers are going to go away when automated, uh, what do you call it? You know, when Elon Musk finishes his all his um, autopilot trucks, right? And those things are all in uh, long range freight across the country. But there's going to be some industries where, you know, Robots aren't going to build buildings anytime soon. Um, there's still going to be a need a lot of people. Um, it, when you have people, then it takes, you know, you need people all the way through the ranks. It's just construction is such a, such a interesting um, industry where, you know, there's so much that so temporary where, you know, it, it doesn't follow a formula necessarily. So it's always just going to take people and problem solving and learning and building upon it and, and, you know, bringing in new technology and, um, so, yeah, people. <laughs> and also the way I think about it, it's like, okay, sure, jobs are going to be taken away, but jobs will be created. Like okay. at the end of the day, when jobs are taken away, there's just going to be a new job that's created for something different to support that. So at the end of the day, I actually, I am of the school of thought that you can either embrace change or you can resist change. But if you resist change, it's too bad because it's going to change anyway. So you might as well just learn to embrace it to some extent or else you'll just be one of those people who are saying, oh, the world should be like this. I remember when the world was like this. You know, it was so great back then. The world has gotten horrible. And it might be your opinion and it is what it is. But at the end of the day, it's not going to change for your opinion. So let's see how we could leverage chat GPT to make ourselves better and help me recruit better, help you run projects better, help your leaders lead better, help people train better. How can we implement all these things to actually be our friend and be our ally as opposed to just being scared of it? Because it's going to help somebody. I'd rather it help me than, than help, you know, well, I, I want to help everyone, but I want to take advantage of it too, if you will. Yeah. I mean, as long as using it to kind of help you using it as an assistant, right? Using it to help generate kind of assistant level stuff and to help, you know, instead of Googling it, you know, maybe you could just go to that. It'll give you like basically the same thing and more of a, more of a readable format and stuff. So hell, somebody was telling me they had it, it built an Excel file for them. I was like, what? And so it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Well, we've gone down the rabbit hole of chat GPT. I definitely wasn't expecting to do this, but it's <laughs> a hot topic and pretty interesting for me. So I appreciate you playing ball with me. <laughs> uh, so go ahead, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I actually built a whole, uh, just trying it out. Um, it gave me like 21, uh, what, did, what did I call it? 21 lessons, you know, young construction professionals need to know. And it spit out like all this stuff. And I literally just copy pasted it, put it into a, a Canva uh, slide deck for a LinkedIn carousel just to, just to see. And people loved it. And like, I mean, obviously I don't want to, that's not going to become my content creation method is just copy pasting off chat GTP, but it was just a trial effort. And just to see if like if it resonated with people and it was it was pretty damn spot on you know what's so interesting i could feel it in your voice and i could feel it in myself too when i'm doing this it's like you don't want people to think you are chat gpt you don't want, we don't want people to think oh this guy's just posting content from chat gpt every day mm -hmm. but i think there's levels to this it's like first of all you have to ask the question to ask the to get the best answer, you need to ask the best question. So first of all, it involves knowing what question to ask and how to ask it. Mm -hmm. And second of all, a lot of the time, it can just provide a framework at the end of the day for a starting point. It can just yeah. give you ideas. It can kickstart the content creation process. Then you go in and add your personal flair. Then you go in and change tweak this to be more fit to how you believe or you see the world. Mm -hmm. So it could, it doesn't have to be like you're copy pasting. That's all you're doing. I, I, I could feel people actually starting to feel like, oh, I don't want to be like that chat GPT guy or girl. But right. um, yeah, I think there's a fine line that we could play around with to to bring as much value without just regurgitating what they have to say on chat GPT, you know? What I plan on doing with it is kind of using it for kind of the... Uh just kind of the, the idea generation, right? And then um, kind of, it helps alleviate writer's block, essentially. So give me 10 post ideas and you can get it. And then you, know, you take it, oh, this idea. And if you've been around construction or the industry long enough, you've got stories and you've got lessons learned and you know, it'll just trigger some story you've got. And you're like, oh, hey, I didn't even think about that. Cause you're kind of sitting there trying to with writer's block. And so just kind of basically giving you the ideas is probably the, the in the framework is probably the best use of it, I'd say. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Well, hey, Matt, this has been a killer podcast. I've really enjoyed our time together, but I want to make sure that you're able to highlight anything you want to highlight before we go. We already know the podcast is coming. Everybody, I suggest that you go, number one, add Matt on LinkedIn. Number two, shout him, shoot him a message to tell him that he's awesome and then you did a great podcast <laughs> today because he did. And you're going to see his content coming out. But other than that, is there anything you want to highlight? Um, no, I mean, go, if you're interested in staying curious in the construction industry, uh, go subscribe to the newsletter. Um, there's about 400, just almost 500 people right now. And so it's been growing steady. It's, um, people are liking it. I always ask people, you know, Hey, what can I change? What do you like? What do you hate? And everyone's like, you're doing great. I'm like, well, that's not very helpful, but I mean, I, I guess it's good feedback. So, um, it's on Substack. The, uh, the title of it's construction yeti.substack.com. That's the link. So go subscribe. Um, I'll be putting all the podcasts on there as well. That'll kind of be a roundup of kind of all the stuff I'm working on. Um, podcasts like this, I'll link them on there just to kind of help share what everyone's working on. So, Awesome. Well, a true pleasure to have you on the show. Much appreciated, Matt. And uh, our guests are in for a treat. So thank you for being on. Thanks for having me, Matt. Appreciate it.